This Intel NUC is a classic when it comes to the world of mini PCs, at least in my opinion. When these first hit the market, I was eager to get my hands on one, but back then it was just out of my budget. Fast forward to today though, and these little guys are much more affordable. So that raises the question, are these still capable little machines? Well, in this video, we're going to put this Nook to use as a simple desktop system, a home server, and more. And who knows, we might just uncover a few hidden gems that make this Nook much more impressive than you'd expect. So let's get started. Now, regardless of whether you're looking to use one of these maybe as a simple desktop system or a server of sorts, one helpful tool you'll want to make sure you have is a solid VPN, which is easy thanks to the sponsor of today's video, Private Internet Access. Now, I'm sure many of you know that VPNs are great for encrypting your network traffic, masking your IP address, protecting you on a public Wi-Fi network, or letting you access content from other regions. While I do like to host my own VPN servers, and I know many of you do as well, I also use private internet access. With tons of servers across 91 countries, PIA gives me access to content I normally wouldn't have access to, which is sometimes helpful when researching a project or when I just want to watch specific shows. One feature I really like is that PIA works on Linux, even in the command line. One useful thing I've found is that PIA works really well with a container called Gluten. This lets you easily tunnel traffic from other containers through PIA with almost zero configuration. PIA also supports unlimited devices on almost any platform, from iOS and Android to, as I mentioned earlier, Linux. And with a strict no logs policy verified by independent audits, your privacy is well protected. If you want to take advantage of everything that a great VPN can offer, make sure to check out Private Internet Access by using my link down in the description. With that, you can get 83% off, plus 4 months for free. Now before we dive into the specifics of this little nook, I want to give a little bit of backstory. I had an awesome viewer reach out to me a few months back, thanks Alan, offering to send over some Intel nooks. And while I was really appreciative, honestly, I wasn't all that interested. I think part of it was that while I like mini PCs, sometimes they can just get a little bit boring and repetitive. And also, I think the Intel nooks are pretty well known, and so maybe not that exciting for a video. But whenever I pulled the first Nook out of the box, I got pretty excited when I saw those blue and orange USB ports. That's because I sort of forgot that when these first came out, I was dying to get my hands on one. In a previous life before I was making these YouTube videos, mostly what I did was music production and mixing, and I primarily worked with Macs. And back in the day, these Intel Nooks were great for Hackintosh builds. However, I already had a MacBook that I used, and so I could just never quite justify the cost and the time to buy one of these and then turn it into a Hackintosh. But I remember having these in a shopping cart multiple times and just really, really wanting to pull the trigger. And for some reason, the blue and orange USB ports were just sort of burned into my memory. Also, while this isn't the oldest Nook, I still feel like this lineup is a bit of a classic, and I thought it was worth covering, especially now that the Nooks have been discontinued by Intel at least, and are now being carried by Asus. This model specifically is the Nook 7 i5 BNH, which features the KB Lake Core i5 7260U, a two-core, four-thread processor with a max turbo frequency of 3.4 GHz and a base frequency of 2.2 GHz. On the front, there's the two blue and orange USB 3 ports, a combo audio jack and power button, and on the side there's a micro SD card slot. On the back there's a 19 volt barrel jack for power, an HDMI port, one gigabit ethernet connection, and two more USB 3 ports. But there's also a Thunderbolt 3 port. In fact, this is actually what made these pretty popular for Hackintosh builds, because at the time most PCs didn't have Thunderbolt. To see if there was anything more to offer on the inside, I removed four screws to take off the bottom cover, and then two more screws that were holding in the motherboard. Overall, the motherboard is really simple. It has a single SATA port for either an SSD or two and a half inch hard drive, which could go in this little slot here. The Wi-Fi controller on this system is soldered to the motherboard, so the only PCIe lanes you'll have access to are the four for the single NVMe SSD slot. For RAM, there's two DDR4 SODIMM sockets, which can support up to a max of 64 gigabytes. On the bottom is the CPU, which is covered by the heatsink and fan. And as per usual, I wanted to replace the thermal paste and get the system cleaned up a bit. Once I got the cooler removed, I noticed these two little pads on the CPU, and I wasn't really sure if they were thermal pads or just to protect something from shorting out, but I didn't want to remove them, so I carefully used a Q-tip to remove the old thermal paste. Once I got that off, I cleaned up all of the components a bit, reapplied some new thermal paste, and then assembled the system. 
And for some reason, I was being dumb and forgot that this system uses DDR4 and not DDR3, and I don't really have a whole lot of extra DDR4 soda modules lying around, so the only matching set I could find was actually this 32 gigabyte kit that came out of my framework laptop. Maybe a bit overkill, but it should get the job done. Other than the glossy top cover, which is a bit of a fingerprint magnet, I love the look of this thing. Probably just because of those blue and orange USB ports. With the system all cleaned up and put back together, it was time to see what all it could do. And there's really a lot of things you could do with a system like this. First of all, you could use it as a simple desktop for responding to emails and doing work and watching some YouTube videos. Or you could also set it up as a home server, where you could run something like Home Assistant, or maybe even stream some media with Jellyfin, or maybe even run some game servers or something. Speaking of games, you're probably not going to be doing any serious gaming on this thing, but it might work well as sort of a thin client, where you could plug this into your living room TV, and then stream games from your gaming desktop. Or maybe you could use it just for some classic retro emulation. These are all great ideas, but before doing any of them, well, I needed to make sure this actually worked. After getting all the cables plugged in and hitting the power button, it didn't turn on for quite some time. I was really starting to worry that maybe the RAM I used wasn't compatible, but after a few minutes, it finally posted. I first tried spamming the delete key to get to the BIOS, but that didn't work, so I looked up that with this system you need to hit the F2 key, but that also didn't work. So next, I tried actually plugging in the keyboard, and that seemed to do the trick. Once I finally got into the BIOS, I was met with probably the nicest UEFI I've ever experienced. It was packed with features, looked incredible, and even had a search feature which I am positive works better than Windows Search. I also found another cool feature that lets you modify the button and ring LEDs based off of the power state of the system. After playing with that for longer than I'd like to admit, I dropped in an NVMe SSD and then started installing, not Windows, but Linux. Normally Windows is kind of my default for desktop stuff, but I decided to mix it up with this video and go with Linux Mint as that's actually the distro I've been using on my laptop for a while. Overall, I had a really smooth and simple experience. Browsing files on my NAS was really snappy, searching the web was a breeze, and YouTube playback was actually really solid. I had no problems playing 4K60 videos without even using the h 264 fi plugin. Also, while doing all of that, the system stayed nice and quiet. In fact, I barely even noticed the fan throughout most of my testing. I even decided to give a little bit of gaming a shot and installed Steam, and other than whatever this font is, it installed with no issues, and I was even able to play a simple game like Hollow Knight, no problem. The hardware acceleration I was seeing when watching YouTube on this thing was sort of impressive, and it inspired me to install OBS to see if this could handle some lightweight streaming. That turned out to be a bit of a bust though. It was probably a driver issue, but I couldn't get quick sync encoding to work, and when I switched to software encoding with lower quality settings, well, it seemed to be working, but whenever I would finish recording, the files just wouldn't exist. I'm sure someone's going to comment such and such about what I needed to have installed and modified to get it to work in Linux Mint, but this is a problem I never had in Windows, which is what I installed next. Originally, I decided to give Windows 11 a shot, and that actually installed with no issues and seemed to be working well until I tried to install drivers. A lot of the drivers didn't seem to install on their own, so I tried hunting them down on Intel's website, but I struggled to find them. Finally, I realized that Intel no longer carries the NUC lineup and that moved over to ASUS, so I went to their website and was able to finally find the drivers. However, the only drivers for Windows 11 were for the chipset and Wi-Fi. There were more drivers, like for Thunderbolt or Audio for Windows 10, so I tried giving those a shot, but I couldn't get Thunderbolt or Audio to work. So I decided to switch over to Windows 10, but there I was still met with some of the same problems. The Thunderbolt controller wasn't showing up in Device Manager, and I still couldn't get audio working. Well, that was until I had the thought to finally just plug something into the headphone jack, and what do you know, it worked. That being said, I really don't like the placement of the headphone jack because, well, it's really easy to accidentally bump the power button, which I found out the hard way. So I was able to get audio working, but not immediately for the HDMI output. I kind of assumed that Windows would install the correct drivers for that since it's just a standard Intel chip, but I actually had to go download and install the specific drivers for this Nook to get audio to work over HDMI. Now it is possible that since I got these issues sorted out in Windows 10 that they would work in Windows 11. In fact, I think it's probably pretty likely, but I didn't take the time to go figure it out for myself. I was still running into one issue though, which was that Thunderbolt didn't seem to be working still. I went in and confirmed that it was enabled in the BIOS, I downloaded and installed the drivers from ASUS's website, and still nothing. 
Now, I remembered that at some point back in the day when I was trying to get Thunderbolt working on an old desktop system that I had to go download something from the Microsoft Store. But it seemed like the Microsoft Store was just going to be stuck updating perpetually, so I started looking around for other things and eventually ended up at the Windows Update Settings page where you could optionally install some other drivers. Now, I forgot to record my screen when I installed these, so I can't remember specifically what they were, but they were labeled like Intel something. I downloaded those, restarted the machine, and then the Thunderbolt controller seemed to show up in Device Manager. I tried testing it out with this Thunderbolt DAS that was actually sent in from another viewer, but I'm pretty sure that system's dead. So I switched over to a Thunderbolt dock from Ugreen, and that worked just fine. So while it is a little bit tricky to get this set up in Windows, this does come with Thunderbolt 3, which definitely opens up some options in terms of expansion. Once I knew I had all the drivers installed and everything working, I decided to finally give OBS a shot again in Windows, and this actually worked really well. Using the QuickSync H.264 encoder, I was able to get pretty decent looking footage. I really don't know how practical or useful this could be, but hey, it sort of works. Overall, other than the kind of annoying drivers and such, this thing seemed to work pretty well for desktop usage, but what about using it as a home server? Well, for this, as I usually do, I installed Proxmox and then installed a few different LXC containers. I installed one for Home Assistant to get an idea of how well this could handle some lightweight tasks, and as expected, it handled it perfectly. For something a little bit more demanding, I set up an LXC container with Debian and then installed Crafty Controller to run a Minecraft server. When running just a vanilla 20.4 server, everything was pretty smooth. There were some spikes on the CPU, but I had no noticeable issues with chunks rendering or anything like that. So while this might not work well for tons of concurrent players, I feel like this would most likely handle a pretty simple small server just fine. Now when it comes to desktop CPUs at least, the iGPUs on the 7th gen chips or newer are able to handle transcoding 10-bit HEVC, which is great if you want to run a Jellyfin or Plex server. However, I wasn't entirely sure if that would be the same for the mobile lineup of CPUs. So I installed Jellyfin, enabled hardware accelerated transcoding using QuickSync, and found that with 4K HEVC 10-bit files, I was able to transcode them to 1080p and get around 44 frames per second without any issues. If I tried transcoding that same file but stuck with 4K, it was technically showing that I was getting a similar frame rate with transcoding, but I would get these noticeable hitches, and I'm not entirely sure why. When transcoding some 4K 8-bit footage down to 720p, I was able to get over 160 frames per second. So it seems like these could work really well as a simple lightweight box for running something like Plex or Jellyfin, however with only room for one extra drive, storage might be a little bit of a limitation. Now instead of using this to stream stuff to your TVs and devices, you technically could hook this up and have a pretty cool little home theater PC. And more than that, you could use this to remote in with something like Moonlight or Parsec and stream your gaming PC to your living room or whatever you want. So to test that out, I hopped back into Linux Mint and installed Moonlight. If you're not familiar, Moonlight is an app that you can use to stream from other computers that are running a server called Sunshine, which I have running on my desktop PC. So once I got Moonlight installed, I was able to remote into my desktop and stream a game that there was no way I'd be able to play on this little nook. I had no issues and was getting a buttery smooth stream with basically no latency. I also installed RetroArch to test out some retro emulation. I was also able to connect my Xbox One controller over Bluetooth with no issues and hop into some Mario Kart 64. While I was testing out ROMs and emulators, I found that the micro SD card slot on the side could actually be pretty useful if you were wanting to set this up as a little emulation machine that maybe you didn't want to connect to the internet for your kids or something. So all in all, it seems like this six or seven year old Nook is still pretty usable in a lot of ways, but well, should you get one? I mean, aren't there thousands of N100 mini PCs that are probably better and more efficient and still really cheap? Well, for that, I think we should probably look a little bit more into price and performance. For a quick spot check on CPU performance, I ran Cinebench R23, and I also grabbed the results from a cheap N100 mini PC that I took a look at a while back, as I actually do think that's a pretty good comparison in 2024. In Cinebench, I was actually a bit surprised to see nearly identical results both in single and multi-threaded workloads. Especially while this Nook 7 uses a hyper-threaded dual-core CPU, while the N100 is a true quad-core. When you look at power though, that's where you see how the N100 excels. Total system idle power draw was roughly 50% higher with the older Nook, and when running Cinebench R23, it was essentially drawing twice as much power as the N100 PC. So in terms of performance and efficiency, you can expect this Nook to perform a little bit slower than most N100 mini PCs, while drawing anywhere from 50% to 200% more power. But what about the price? 
While I have seen these nooks or similar ones go for $50 or $60 in auctions, I think it's pretty fair to say that you could get one with a small SSD and some RAM for around $100. For a lightweight N100 mini PC with a small SSD and 8 gigs of RAM, I think you can probably find a deal for around $150. Now if you're using this system as a desktop where you may only use it for an hour or two every day, power draw isn't really going to make that big of a difference, so you could argue that you could go with a cheaper older Nook and save a bit of money. But what if you're using this as a server where it'll be running 24-7? Well in that case, power might start to factor in a little bit more. For this, I like to take a look at this break-even calculator I made a little while back. Now, for most people, when they're running a server, the CPU isn't going to be just crunching away all the time, and most likely your system's going to be sitting pretty close to its idle power draw. If you live somewhere like where I do, where power's pretty cheap, let's say 15 cents per kilowatt hour, it would take something like 12 years or so before you finally broke even and it was justifiable to buy something like this mini PC over an older NUC. Even if your power costs are much higher, let's say 50 cents per kilowatt hour, it would still take roughly four years before you started saving money by going with the newer, more efficient system. Really, this always comes down to a personal calculation. Maybe you are running something that's demanding and your system's going to be chugging away 24 seven. And in that case, yeah, it's gonna make more sense to go with a more modern, efficient system to help you save some money. But unless that's the case, it seems like this little nook is still a really solid option for a variety of tasks. It doesn't have a ton of horsepower or expandability, but it is small, quiet, and fairly efficient for its age, and capable of a lot of tasks. Oh yeah, and did I mention you can make these LEDs do cool things? But what do you guys think though? Do you still think it's worth it to get an actual Intel NUC, or is it better to just pick up one of the plethora of mini PCs that have flooded the market over the last few years? Let me know down in the comments. As always, I had a ton of fun making this video, and I really hope you did as well. If so, maybe like, maybe comment, maybe become a raid member for as little as a dollar a month for early access to videos, as well as some behind the scenes and other cool perks. That's about it for this one. <laughs> That's about it for this one though. So as always, thank you guys so much for watching. Stay curious, and I really can't wait to see you in the next one. You wanna help me? You can come be on a tube video, come here. Yeah, push it. Okay, now wait. Now we wait, and it's gonna turn on. Yay, it worked. Yeah.